Well, I wasn't actually. <laughs> but Start you're recording. It. It's oh, you recording. are recording. It's recording. You've done it. Oh, well done. <laughs> Why is Tommy so loud and so clear? Just some people have it. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's true, mate. <laughs> comes from realising that kids in particular in the modern day world were struggling just from having too much going on and he picks out the stuff, the choice, the information and things being just too fast. Let's watch a film tonight and we sort of sit down with some food and then, you know, half an hour's gone and we still haven't actually chosen what to watch because there's just so many different things to choose from. I think multitasking does kind of fall into this too much information, right, Pillar? You know, if you're trying to do more than two things, you're probably drastically failing. You're actually burning the, the toast at the same time as not entertaining the child and probably misordering that thing that you're ordering on your phone at the same time. It sounds like you're speaking from experience with that particular one, Tommy. It was very specific. The experience of watching others, obviously. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Sketchplanations, the podcast. This week, we're talking about the four pillars of too much. Too much stuff, too much choice, too much information, and too much speed. But before that, there's this. On June 23rd, 1983, Jack and Jill went up the hill to fetch a simple pail or bucket of water. Having reached the summit of this incline, Jack had an accident. In the mayhem and confusion, Jack's headwear was subjected to irreparable damage. Initially a bystander to events, tragically Jill was soon to suffer the same fate. There are unconfirmed stories that Jack attempted to mend his injuries with vinegar and brown paper now very much ill-advised by medical professionals. What really happened up there on the hill with the water and the bucket? I'm ex-wannabe detective Rob Bell. With over a decade of parenting proficiency, John O'Hay is the old King Cole of credibility. And back from his own downfall of doom, the Humpty Dumpty of dependability, Tom Pellero. Together, this is your trustworthy team that brings you Real nursery crimes coming soon. <laughs> Good evening, gents. Oh my God. I can understand now why you were so excited about getting into that. I don't, what are we talking about? It's so good. Do we have to remind people this is a sketch of nation? Just to off. make sure. I get carried away and a bit, a bit lost actually sometimes. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. how how are you boys doing? You right? Yeah, good. I didn't realise those extra verses for Jack and Jill. Yeah, I know. Gosh, yeah. I I seem to remember as a kid the one about the um, brown paper and vinegar. I do, I do kind of remember that, but I couldn't remember it off the top of my bun, so I had to, um, I had to look that one up. But you know, nursery rhymes. You know, I assume they're they've been a part of all of our lives. In fact, the way I see it, they're probably kind of part of your life at three different times of your life right when you're a kid if you become a parent and then if you become a grandparent i reckon yeah i've got a funny story about jack and jill and so as you know i'm my eldest son uh, jack is, is called jack uh, and when we went into the hospital for um for a second uh, for our daughter um i thought about i'd play a trick on my parents so um we had the so we were lucky enough to have the second daughter she was born she was brilliant we called her poppy but we texted my parents saying um so happy because they were away so happy that uh, our baby baby girl jill has been born um we can't wait to see you love from tom sarah jack and jill <laughs> and then i didn't and then i kind of got a bit busy and i forgot to message her again and apparently my mum was just like stewing going, they can't call their child <laughs> <laughs> oh Jack and Jill, they gone. And then a few hours later, I called them, and they were like, "I was like, it was just a joke." And my mum was like, "You rotter!" I was just... <laughs> <laughs> I can just imagine your mum saying that. Yeah, yeah, she wasn't best pleased with me. It was very Amazing. funny though. Amazing, tricky, th tricky things to joke about. I mean, we took this <laughs> comedy the other day. It was, uh, it was they were having a baby, and he's like, "Is everything okay?" No. Everything's great. <laughs> oh. Did you have to say it like that? <laughs> yeah. 
But nursery rhymes, you know, they've they've stood the test of time, haven't they? You know, they're still kicking about, yeah. even in you know in competition with social media. They were a bit like um, like you say, they just they just go around in those fixed phases of life. They remind me of um, like playground games and th- like stuff that happens in primary school where you learn it from like the year above you, yeah, and then you teach it to the year below you, and the, and primary schools just get like stuck in this these phases of these games that last forever and probably each school like learns their own sort of games and yeah you know decades later they're still playing and calling the calling the same game and everybody else is like what are you doing but i bet there are the same games that are played in different uh primary school playgrounds around the country around the world the same game but got completely different names i'm sure that's true yeah yeah yeah. i'd love to i Next time we're together, I'd love to play the game that I played a lot at primary school. We called it Recce. Uh, it's just yes. a tennis ball. I'd love mm. to play that with you guys. I think it'd be brilliant fun. Sounds yeah, good. I've never, never played yeah. that before. Well, you might Maybe have. It just other might have people call name. it tennis. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, have you boys got any favourite nursery rhymes? I mean, you've, you've been in and around them, I'm assuming, more recently than I have. Do you know what? Yeah. Like, for me, when when the kids were really little, they're just like something that they just en- they entertain really little kids. And when they're babies, they're just anything you just need to sing anything. Yeah, you can literally sing whatever you want. So, but you need something to sing. And so, you know, I wish I'd written them all down. Actually, all the little songs, the little mad songs that you sing to while they're a little baby, because I've forgotten them all now. Just like you say, they, yeah. they sort of disappear. Mm. I've forgotten most of the baby age period. It's just sort of a blur the days of <laughs> three or four years of my life. Of fatigue <laughs> of all this. Uh, London Bridge is falling down. It always, for some reason, seems a very memorable one. A tissue and a tissue, they all fall down and that sort of stuff. My mum was very good at them. She would sing them and lullabies and that sort of stuff. I, I, I don't seem to have many to my mind that I can think of. I'm sorry, Rob. Now the old, the old um, was it Hey Diddle Diddle? Uh, yes. I need to get this right. The Hey Diddle Diddle, the cat, cat and, the, and fiddle. the fiddle. The cow jumped over the moon. Yes. The little dog laughed to see such sport, and the dish ran away with the spoon. I mean, what the hell is that all about? Uh, it's mental, isn't it? I'd love to have seen yeah. like a scan of my brain as I heard that for the first time, trying to figure out what, uh, well, what world not, is this? That's not helpful, is it? Really. Yeah. Your parents are singing that to you, smiling. You're like, okay, <laughs> just whatever you say. <laughs> all right. I mean, so, they're all a bit mad, right? You know. Yeah. I, yeah. None of them really make any. I mean, they all have some, like some weird story behind them as to where they came from originally, but they're all a bit. Often they're quite a bit gruesome as well. I don't know. Yeah. Mm. It's strange. <laughs> well, because there's, there's nursery rhymes and then there's fairy tales, right? And there's also fairy gruesome. tales written by. I mean, Hans Christian Andersen was one of the the large um, authors of fairy tales, <laughs> but then also it's the Brothers Grimm, right? Uh, S- some of their stories, are, they're brutal. They're like horror stories. Like Hansel and Gretel. A- Hansel and but Gretel. they to try and get kids to like go to bed, basically. They're just to terrify them into going to sleep or something. I'm not sure that's a great approach, but... but they're proper dark plots, you know. You've got cannibalism, <laughs> you've got infanticide, you've got revenge, you've got gangs of murderers, severed body parts. I mean, it's... It's crazy. Is this what you want to be sending your kids off to bed with? I don't know. Cutting stomachs open and yeah. finding people inside, that kind of thing, yeah. Mm. Uh, Is that often the way with these sort of children's things that actually there's a subplot and a plot, yeah. as it were, that yeah. for the parents, something for the parents to actually enjoy? Uh, a bit like when you watch The Simpsons with the kids, like you, they're not getting half the actual jokes. Or yeah. my eight-year-old with the granny went to see Barbie recently. Mm. And I think there's a lot of content in Barbie, which is not for eight-year-olds. Yeah, there is loads. <laughs> yeah. I've not seen it, but I'm very keen to. Yeah. But so kind of everyone can enjoy it, sort of thing. Yeah, yeah it's a bit of shit. I, I sort of feel like we could do with a bit of a wholesale refresher of like those sort of kid stories, you know. I don't feel like the morals stories. are always, you know, that <laughs> rewarding, you know, ways to live your life. Old, Rapunzel and things like that. I don't, I don't know. Yeah. I'm not, not sure what you're what you're supposed to take away from some of these in order to make yourself a better person. Yeah. <laughs> well, there you go, Johnny. That's your next Nightmare. challenge. 
I, do you know what? Ten I, looked, years. I looked for um, I looked for books of Buddhist children's stories. Oh right, because oh. I think very often the morals in those are really good. I, I didn't really find anything, so I think there's a gap. Yeah. What you want to write some Buddhist children's stories? No, you really you really want to find some, and then write them down and and share them. I yeah. think that would be great. Yeah, so, Buddhism Buddhism has some so, awesome values that when you hear, see it lived in the in cultures that are predominantly Buddhist, it's it's a fantastic way of life. There was a little um, a lot of it an anecdote about. Uh, people asked for anecdotes about Steve Jobs. I once read, and somebody said they were in line with him in a cafeteria or something. He just turned to him. He said, "You know who owns the future? Disney, because Disney is the one setting all the stories, huh. and so they're the ones setting what people will live by." It's sort of an intriguing concept. So all the things you know, like what, you know, I don't know, Frozen and things like that, those kind of morals that people are, the, the kids are learning mm. these days, are all, all the stories that P Pixar put out. I actually thought recently, like, if you look at most kids' films now, most of them, I think are so much better. I was wondering, you know, yeah. usually parents learn to be better parents by the end and kids mm -hmm. learn to be better to their parents by the end. Families, you know, start dysfunctional and then end up... I, I wondered if... All of this will like collectively affect us and make us better societies. We'll have Disney mm. to thank, mm. potentially. Interesting. Yeah. We're moving on from Hansel and Gretel, you know. Yeah, where it's just about scaring kids. <laughs> or, or maybe there is a, a sub subcontext within that. Pretty deep. <laughs> Yeah. A bit too deep. Yeah. There's certainly <laughs> quite a lot of comment going on yeah. about the latest version of Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. I don't want to get into it, but there are certain <laughs> viewpoints coming out of the re-release of that Disney film, which I think is causing them quite a lot of trouble. I think there's a bit of cancel culture around Disney currently in the States, mm. uh, around certain decisions that they're making, be they be they the right or the wrong, but I think it's a big debate, certainly. Mm. You sure you don't want to talk about that, Tommy, and comment on it? Oh, oh fine. I'm <laughs> fine. Thank you. No, so they do better with the newer stories, right? The problem is yeah. it's an old story. Yeah. 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 And one of the big questions is why are they bringing this up if they, like, it was it was the story that really created them. And why are they bringing it up in the sort of negative aspect towards certain parts of it? It's like yeah. they just didn't need to do that. They could have just made up a totally new story. Mm. Laziness, probably. <laughs> What should we do? Oh, it's a oh, writer's we do that one again. It's a writer's strike. <laughs> it's like, oh, you yeah. have, have to do reruns. <laughs> maybe. maybe. Right. Who knows? Well, listen, the time I've allocated this week for nursery rhymes is over. It's time for the childishness to really begin. It's time for the podcast. Let's go. This week we're discussing Jono's sketch that covers the four pillars of too much, or I've also seen it referred to as the four pillars of excess. And it relates to a philosophy that whilst much of something can be great, too much of it can be a real burden. Now before we get going, a quick reminder that you should be able to see this sketch as the artwork for the episode, but if not, I've included a link in the podcast description. And you can find all of Jono's sketches that we talk about in the podcast series, as well as many, many more at sketchplanations.com. And if you've seen a sketch on there that you'd like us to cover in an episode, then let us know. You can email us with your suggestions, as well as any comments or stories from your own experience of the topics that we cover, to... Hello at sketchplanations.com. And we'll be going through your messages from the last week at the very end of the podcast. All right then, Jono. Uh, the four pillars of too much. Well, firstly, let, do you want to tell us what those four pillars are? And then let's talk about how you came across this. Yeah, for sure. So the, the four, it's a, a really simple sketch, but the four pillars of too much are too much stuff, too much or too many choices, too much information and too fast. Mm. And this is a, and this is kind of, as it applies to life generally, right? Well, um, yes, yeah, so I, I, I learned about it. It's, it's an idea from the author of um, a book called Simplicity Parenting, which I was reading when the kids were much smaller. Um, and it comes, it comes from 
essentially like realizing that people in kids in particular in the modern day world were struggling just from having too much going on mm. and he picks out these these four different aspects the stuff the choice the information and things being just too fast and advocates essentially a slowing down of everything and then and actually the power of having less in your life is actually a really positive thing in many cases so that's that's where i, I learned it from so it's 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 simplifying uh it's stripping back and slowing down i guess that that kind of of feeling yeah and 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 obviously the book was about parenting but i mm. i it doesn't i don't feel like it, it has to be i feel like it, yeah. it applies to me just as much now and maybe it affects kids even more maybe but maybe not maybe it affects adults just as much i think maybe it might affect kids more because stuff's happening to them i mean we've talked about in previous episodes how as a kid you have less control over your life because you're not making the ultimate decisions about what you do and what you get up to um so maybe the stuff is happening to them and, and they don't necessarily when you're younger you don't necessarily have the tools or the experience to um understand and analyze what's going on and and you know with a bit more experience i guess we should have those tools or there's a potential that we do have those tools and that experience but it doesn't mean that we always are aware of that and and act wisely on it and just let all this stuff happen and build up in our lives to make it quite complex and quite quite manic sometimes that can be quite stressful i mean i think certainly as parents you have the ability to control a lot of that for your children and so Mm. yeah i mean in that sense it totally makes sense but as parents we as people we can also control a lot of the stuff in our own lives and that my general experience is probably we all benefit from a little bit of of a little bit less very often i think there's a difference as well as adults we get quite good at ignoring things or not seeing things whereas i think as children you could kind of possibly because every so much more is new you, it, it's really kind of bewildering. Um, mm. Whereas adults, I think we get quite good at being like, oh yeah, you know, that's just... Whereas kids are like, oh my gosh, there's a bug on the floor here and they have to stop and look at it and play with it for ages. Whereas we're like, don't even notice it because we're kind of moving through the world, I think, maybe at a great speed as well. Tommy, do you think these um, these four pillars, too much stuff, too much choice, too much information, things happening too fast, do you think there's sometimes a draw to to want more more stuff more choice uh, more information Things yeah happen fast you think as as adults as we, there's a kind of a desire to have all of this stuff well, well as as often is the case it's a contradiction right in and and often the most powerful things are like we want to have nice chilled lives with not too much going on but the second that we realize that saturday afternoon we've got nothing booked we therefore find ourselves looking to book tennis or book swimming or but you know and then we're kind of rushing from this to the other to the other and and we all kind of love to have the sort of you know simple house with not too much out but then we go to the shops and we see a new coffee table or a new picture frame we're like oh wouldn't that look lovely on the side and so we're constantly in this dichotomy of cramming our life with stuff but also wishing we weren't and cramming our house with stuff but clearing out at the same time and their sort of yin the yang the contradiction is is often at play it's funny isn't it because we we're sitting here now and we all know it yeah right? we, we probably know that our houses for yeah. example are full of stuff that we don't necessarily need or don't necessarily use that often yet we've put them there it, it, exactly and um i remember personally watching a program about um some uh, someone some psychologist that was trying to help a family with uh, a child with um adhd or maybe even um, asperger's going beyond that um and when i grew up there was a growing sort of potential link between dyslexics and adhd and there's sort of potentially a bit of a spectrum there and i remember watching this program and what they did is they they basically built a little outhouse for this child and it was completely white and it was a door that you go in and they painted this room completely white and they would, the parent was only allowed to take the child with one toy in there. And I just remember like that feeling of watching this child going into this really calm, clear room with no extra distraction and focus really helped the child chill out. And watching that and going, that felt really appealing to me. So since I always try, but I fail to try and simplify 
than my surroundings and i do find it really really calming so these four pillars for me are very very emotive very uh, special very good to be aware of rob can i ask um i was i was quite happy to see that you chose this as a sketch topic oh, yeah. for the for the podcast yeah and yeah. And also the opposite. I was like, it's quite cringeworthy from an, an old sketch point of view. I know. <laughs> I know. Um, let's let, let, let's yeah. talk about that very quickly now. This is one of your early, early sketches. Right? It is. And so it's it's not, it's very different to the style of the It wasn't drawn by now. John O's son. It's actually genuinely. It's a quick <laughs> sketch, right? You, yeah, you yeah, yeah. It was, it was, this out really it, quickly. It was one a day, no corrections, straight in the notebook. Um, there you go. But I was, I was intrigued what made you choose it. Yeah. Good question, right? So I was, well, I was flicking through a bunch of sketches, seeing what jumped out at me, where I thought there would be something in there for us to talk about. And I thought this one, this one could be quite different. What I like to do when I'm looking at sketches and thinking about what might work well in the podcast is think about, would we all have enough to talk about it? But then would our listeners also, would it give them something to think about? Yeah. And I think these four pillars absolutely did. And and that was just from from the very early sketch, which is the beauty of your sketches and of sketch explanations, Johnny. You can see the sketch and you kind of get what's happening and your brain starts thinking about it very, very quickly. And then when you start reading into it, you go, Yeah, 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 there's definitely something here. That's that's what it was for me. But uh, I mean this is this is the beauty of sketch explanations. <laughs> right? It makes you think about things very you understand it very quickly and, and can make you think about things slightly differently that that's why i chose it I, I thought there was enough to talk about and i thought it's something that probably applies to a lot of people that said do you remember last week i brought up the um the acronym of uh a social demographic of weird mm-hmm. w-e-i-r-d um which was again uh, western educated industrialized rich democratic ah oh, tommy's all over it i did wonder if these four pillars possibly apply more to a weird demographic than to other social demographics around the world. Not necessarily more than any other demographic, but probably a lot more than some demographics. So less less affluent demographics where they don't necessarily have as much choice or in countries where perhaps the economy isn't quite as strong as we're lucky to have here in the UK. Or just the social pressure, isn't there? Because you're sort of just suggesting that this is a result of if they did have enough, if they were richer, they would. But I, I that's possibly true. But I think I'd also question whether it's just our, you know, our brains have been motivated to get more, to fill more, to achieve more. Because of our culture. Yeah. Yeah. Or because of the capitalist world that we live in. Because yes. actually capitalism only continues if we only if we all want another car. Exactly, exactly. So, so, you know, I, I did, I did consider that as well, and I find that quite interesting. That these four pillars are actually uh, dependent on your situation, perhaps. Yeah, and your motivation, yeah, and your for sure. Yeah, but I thought we could have a little, um, we could have a little punch through each of them individually, all right? And just just have a little think about that. So the first one is too much stuff. Um, as you said, something like commerce and capitalism like drives a desire for more stuff, right? And and there is so much, you know. We've, I'm looking in our rooms behind us. You know, we've all got stuff around us. Yeah, hun- hundreds of things. I, I did some um, research on things like storage and and just oh, yeah. dealing with your stuff before um, for a project. And one of the uh, one of the realizations for me was that it's so much easier to get stuff in than it is to get it out. Do you mean in terms of the systems that are there to uh, encourage that? Yeah. um, And assist with that? I I mean, there's there's very little to assist with the out unless it's rubbish or recycling. Mm. Recycling's getting a bit better, right? But unless it's rubbish, you're going to throw it away. It's effort to get it out, whereas it's always easy to go to the shop and buy. Yeah. I've, I've it's a bookshelf behind me at the top is a, a row of books ones that I've read which are time to move on it's more effort for me to do that than it is to order another book on yeah. Amazon or whatever although there are so increasing number of ways of doing it like eBay started yeah. it Vintage there's a great one for books um, 
I can't quite remember the name of it now. So you don't get much, but you get like 40p for books. But like they are coming. But as you say, it's a very much an asymmetric scenario. I, th- I think so. And also there's, it's just much more, it's much more sort of fun, isn't it? It's like it's much yeah. easier to get new, new things in. It's exciting to get new things in. It's not, not as exciting. You were getting rid of things recently, weren't you, Robert? I am. I'm trying to get rid of some furniture. So I'm getting rid of some sofas and coffee tables because I'm doing renovating one of the rooms in the house. And I'm, I've taken to Gumtree and yeah. to FreeCycle, but it's quite an effort. It's quite an effort. Yeah. You, put, you put an ad up and I'm giving it away for free. Yeah. And you put an ad up and you get a few responses and you get back to them as quick as you can saying, yeah, it's all available. You know, let me know what you want and when you're available to come around, have a look and take them away. And most of the time you don't hear back from them. Yeah. And you're, it's, it's difficult. Yeah. But how, does it, how did it feel when you got rid of it? It feels good. I love it. <laughs> yeah. It feels good. Although I did have to help somebody carry us over about half a mile up the road the Amazing. other day. Because I could not in in good conscience <laughs> see them struggle up the road with it. So uh, I gave them a helping hand. Oh, um, which she loved doing as well. Yeah, come on. It was all good. Yeah. Um, Interesting things. But with things like books, right, could you implement a one-in, one-out policy where if you buy a new book, there's one that's got to go somewhere to a charity shop or, you know, as Tommy was saying, through eBay or Vinted or whatever? I mean, Good absolutely, idea. you can. You've just got to do it. <laughs> yeah. It's much easier not to do it. I think, you know. Although, Johnny, sometimes I do think I wonder if we'll be able to continue to throw things away in the way that we currently do. Like we've done a few house clear outs here, Sarah and, and I are pretty, pretty militant about it, actually. And sometimes I think, oh, my gosh, we just filled the car full of stuff to take to the sort of recycling the, the, the junk place. And it's like, we'll, and it's not going to cost us anything to get rid of this, thank goodness, because possibly I'd really consider doing it if it did. But like you wonder if that will continue or how long it will continue for. Yeah, I, I really like. Um, something I saw in a documentary was you know you can't you can't throw something away there is no away yeah um, it's all here you know there's there is no yeah, exactly so and and as you say if it costs you money to if it costs you more money to get rid of it you'd think twice about getting it in yeah um, that said it's still easier to get it in and it's exciting to get it in <laughs> well I think I, I think we're starting to touch on something that I know we all have a concern for which is the environmental aspect of stuff right continuously accumulating stuff right that stuff has had to come from somewhere it's had to be produced and there's energy and there's a climate effect of more stuff right I'm, i'm i'm certainly aware of that and it does that does prevent me from getting some stuff i'm quite happy to keep making do with stuff that doesn't work quite as well as it could do or should do you certainly are. I, I think don't you're the want master. More actually. stuff or new stuff. Because it, well, it does kind of work, but just, you know, it's a bit of a knack to it. Do you personally have a one in, one out about stuff? Because it kind of feels like no. for, a, for a stuff to get into your life takes a lot of, like, it's really got to be worth it for you. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, I don't act on, whim, on a whim. You're not really sure. an accumulator of stuff in any shape or form, are you? Well, I don't know. Uh, no, I could, you're very I could, good. could do with a clear out but doing a clear out hurts hurts me i hate i have to really psych myself up for it it's like right yeah. don't think about this too much because for sentimental yeah. reasons and for reasons oh. i was talking about there i do get i do get attached I, to stuff I, i've got a tip tip for you is get somebody oh, else to to choose your stuff it's much easier to make decisions about other people's stuff <laughs> it is and it is about much your own stuff. like rob you've never you'll never need this you know, I, yeah. I know somebody who would be well up for that right now. Well up for it, yeah. Ooh. Oh, she would be all over. You wouldn't. It. You probably wouldn't have many clothes left, actually, would you? <laughs> it'd, be a, it'd be a change of clothes. It'd be a, <laughs> change of clothes. It'd be a big change of uh, glassware. Uh, yeah. <laughs> pots and pans. Yeah. Um, it, is, um, it is really very liberating doing it. I've yeah. say. Yeah. You'll enjoy it. I'd encourage anyone to like maybe because it's well a new a fresh start effect, John, isn't it? Right, because it's sort of just going back to school, or we're recording this, and it's just going back to school. I don't know what will come out, but just, just you 
Yeah, that, Luckier that, stuff. Really consider it. It's like that with the the clean desk or that white room. It just gives you allows you to focus on what yeah. you're doing right now. Like, um, like back to the the kids bit. Uh, my wife is really good about. We have a number of toys in the house, but in a way, there's just like too many to know what to do with. And she's very good at like rotating what was in. Yes, and oh, putting really? the others away, and then yes. putting the bringing one out, and it's almost like it's a new toy. Yeah. It's it was really interesting, but when there are lots around, it's it, I don't know. They all sort of blur into one. Does Actually, that kind of um, does that encourage more creativity then with with whatever toy there is there, rather than just oh, I'm bored with this now, let's move on to the other. I've got this one toy, and if I'm going to keep myself entertained, I need to find a way to do that. I'm bored with playing it in this way. I'll find another way to play with it. Definitely. And so it's a really good, you're very lucky to have Maria to do that for you. <laughs> the, the time that it happens for us is when we bring stuff down because we're going to give it away or chuck it away or give it to our nieces or that sort of thing. And as soon as the kids see it, they're like, oh my God, I love this. Yeah. You can't throw this away. You can't give this away. But then they start playing. It's like, you didn't even know that we've had, that's been hidden up in the attic for two years. You didn't have a clue about it. And now it's absolutely vital that we don't throw it, you know, give it away. So rotation, excellent idea, Joy. Sneak it out of the house. When we, yeah. um, uh, when we moved back from the US to the UK, it was quite an interesting exercise. A couple of things we really noticed. So, you know, basically, you know, we sold our, sold our car, sold as much as we could because mm -hmm. anything else we had to put on a boat and take back to the UK. So it was a really good way to like sort through everything you had. Um, and I remember literally taking like the last box of stuff to the post office, the stuff that missed the boat and we were leave, literally getting on a plane tomorrow and otherwise we're going to have to take them with us wherever we're going. Um, but it was a lot of effort to actually, to to fully declutter from all your stuff. Like it took us weeks. Mm. You can't, you can't just like go, oh, I don't, I don't want the car anymore. Mm. I just, leave it yeah you can't you can't do that like you have to sell it all no. right um even though it was a, it was an old car and then and then we and we lived we were traveling so we lived with 10 months just with a backpack and it was a, a brilliant really and you come back yeah. you come back after that and you're like oh, why do i need all this stuff we just go out of the backpack i mean it's a bit nicer to have some of the stuff but definitely you, you realize how little you actually do need on yeah. a regular basis yeah i agree I agree. Oh, we've got there's a mutual friend of ours, um, Philly, who's very good at this. He's he he moved house quite a lot within a short period of time for a while when he used to live here in London, and he had a philosophy of, listen, I don't ever want to accumulate any more stuff than two big bags full. <laughs> then I'm yeah. good. Then yeah. I'm great. And he just, I do remember he, he lives like that. I do remember those brilliant days where you could literally put all your stuff in your car. Mm. I remember that that was uni and then first few houses it's like because you're moving quite regularly so it's like yeah. just get everything in the 205 and that's that's it moving house right moving house is a great catalyst to, yeah. to declutter which mm. is when you find the box that is in the attic that you moved into this house <laughs> <laughs> and, and never got out because it was at the yes. back and you realize yes. you definitely <laughs> shouldn't need that one but maybe i will oh. <laughs> no time to sort it now i'll take it with me before we move on, can I just oh, yeah, plug, plug another sketch? Yes, which please. Very little known oh. one. Um, John, called... this is Sketch for Nations, the podcast. You plug <laughs> away. Can I, can I plug a sketch? <laughs> um, it's called the, it's called the Laws of Expansion, um, which I don't know if you came across, and it's quite re it's quite relevant. It was it was essentially kicked off with um, there's something called Parkinson's Law, which is the work expands to fill the time available. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, but I think there are two others, which is stuff expands to fill the available space oh. and cost expands to fill the available budget. Yes, mate. Yeah. Totally. There, there are various like genuine physical physics expansion laws. But I think these one, you know, like if, if you have a big house, you will eventually fill that house, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. I remember when when I had a, um, an office job and, you know, a salaried job. I got like, I don't know, a, a pay rise of a thousand pounds, right? And, you know, you know, it's an amount of money, but it made absolutely no difference because you just, or maybe even 2000, but I don't know what it was. It wasn't loads, but it, it didn't make a, a single difference the way I live my life, right? Because if you're given a bit more, you're going to spend it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. it's not just stuff. 
Is it Boyle's law though that uh, really is the physics law that a gas mm -hmm. will occupy the space it, that's, it, that contains it? It could well be. It's been a while. Good engineering knowledge, Rob. Let's just say probably. <laughs> probably Boyle's law. <laughs> we've got we've got three more um, pillars to get through. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, we've got three more yeah. pillars. Right. So the second pillar was um, too much choice. Now, I, I can certainly be paralysed by too much choice. But <laughs> I will say, and we're not going back to too much stuff, but sometimes the the fact that there's too much choice benefits me from avoiding Why? having too much stuff yeah. because there'll be so much, so many decisions, I can't make that decision. And so in the end, I just go, oh, actually, I don't need it. So I won't bother buying it yeah. anyway. So when it comes to purchasing goods and products, um, the fact that there's too much choice and being paralysed by that helps my too much stuff pillar definitely <sighs> yeah <laughs> there's lots of research on this isn't there johnny i, I mean there's there's a sketch about the paradox of choice of course there yeah. is yeah. <clears throat> too much choice leads to paralysis and actually i think quite interestingly which is what i tried to get across in that sketch the dissatisfaction and and the the flow goes you're like oh it was it raised expectations you're like oh there's so much stuff so one of these has got to be amazing this is going to be great and then um the opportunity cost is like well if i pick this one it means i'm not getting those oh. ones maybe they're <laughs> good and then you think well if i i, I think i might maybe i'll prefer the other one oh i'm not sure anymore and then you're not as happy with the one you've got and then if yeah. you don't get something that you like, you're like, oh, I never picked the best one. You know, like self-blame. And so you, actually more choices <laughs> made you unhappy with yourself. I yes. like, you know, you know the, the classic thing with the supermarket line, right? There's loads of there's loads of lines. It doesn't, it doesn't happen so much anymore. But like the trolley lines, you're like, which one should I get into? Maybe it's the passport line at the uh, at the airport or something. Yeah. And you're like, okay, well, this one looks good. And then of course it's not the good one. And you're like, oh. I always pick the wrong, <laughs> the wrong line, and it makes you unhappy. Whereas if there was just one line, you'd be fine. I totally yeah. agree. Yeah. Just do the weight anyway. Yes, paradox so, of choice. Yeah. So that, just quickly on an admin point, that's the paradox of choice. Mm. Yeah. Uh, what were the other sketches? Uh, the expansion. Laws of expansion. The the what expansion? Exp laws, laws of laws. Yeah. Uh, which is number two three eight. Oh, very good. For any fact finders out there. Two, three, eight, sketch. Right, sorry, sorry to um, interrupt the flow there. Um, Good idea, Rob. Yeah, so shopping is definitely, shopping and retail is definitely one area. Do you remember the, um, you know, the online fashion retailers? Mm. Like, like, like ASOS, for example. I, what I used to do, and I think what was very easy to do through their UX, through their user experience, was to, if you were stuck for choice, buy three of buy three items that you have them sent to you, try them all on, and send the others back. I think they've made that more difficult now because of, there's so much, obviously, then delivery of yeah. items and transportation of items, which I don't think was great for them financially or environmentally either. So I'm, I'm quite glad that they've stopped doing that now. But yeah, from that, there's there's definitely choice when it comes to to retail and shopping. But I was also thinking about like a choice for jobs and careers in life as yeah. well. You know, there's obviously a massive choice for that. There's there's a choice for entertainment and hobbies and how we spend our free time as well. <gasps> TV, I've absolutely and Netflix. Sarah and I will turn it on and be like, oh, what should we? Let's watch a film tonight. It's Friday night. We've had a long week, and we sort of sit down with some food. And then, you know, half an hour's gone and we still haven't actually chosen what to watch because there's just so many different things to choose from. And you kind of, I thought that the whole point of Netflix was it would kind of understand us and then just tell us what to watch. And like, <laughs> is that not the point of the algorithms or whatever? When are these AI and these algorithms going to get better and just be like, yeah, you should just watch this. I, I, remember, I remember once um, we got some, I don't know, it was like a phone contract. So we got like a free film each week and it wasn't like a, a voucher for a film it was like there was this film. here is that's, this film that's oh. that's free that we and actually i remember it was quite nice first of all we watched a few films that we would never have otherwise watched secondly we never yeah. had, had to think about it mm. yes and, and yeah thirdly like you didn't you didn't waste any time deciding what no. to do you're just like we're just going to watch this one and also if if you watched it you didn't like it well it wasn't your fault you didn't yeah pick a no bad one's to one, blame right? Yeah, that was the one they re they recommended. It could have been better, but you know it's right. Yeah. <laughs> it was quite it was quite nice when somebody just gave you one. Here you go. 
do that. That's really good. There's a, there was a, a pizza place in, in Berkeley, actually, which I did the Paradox of Choice about, and and they just did one pizza every week. It's called Cheese Ball Pizza. It was amazing. Every day, sorry. The one flavour of pizza, you know, it might be broccoli and brie today. I don't know, whatever it was. It was Berkeley, so it was that kind of thing. Um, <laughs> And it was always delicious, and you never had to think. But all you had to do when you got to the thing was say, "I'll have um, two slices or four slices," and they just did it by the slice. And that, you know, or Rob, Rob, you would have six slices. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's there, there there's another restaurant in London. I think there are a few of them kicking about. I I used to go to one in Paris as well. It's called the the Le Relais de Venise. There, it's a steak joint right yeah and you go in they give you a salad with a lovely dressing on it and you get steak yeah. and chips the only yeah. choice you get is um i think they've probably got three different wines and how you want your steak cooked boof yeah. done lovely on lovely. entrecote is the same that's it entrecote is the, entrecote. It's the same as well. it, yeah. it, it's my favorite restaurant i love it because they're just so and i actually wish more restaurants would be like this is what we do I especially find it with pubs. You walk into a pub and they've got like a hundred things on the menu and you're like, so all of these have just come out of the freezer, right? Because there's no way you can have sea bass and lamb shank and steak and and, and a pie and fish fig. You know, mm. like you can't have all of that fresh. So you've probably <laughs> therefore got nothing actually fresh. Like, can't you just pick a few things and do them well? Like, I'd much rather that, I think personally but uh, i don't run restaurants so i don't know do you think there's a demand do you think there would be a demand now from consumers for a, a brand to offer fewer choices do you think people would respond well to that depending on i guess depending on what it was we talked about food we talked about um fashion i think there is and i think there are some that do very well out of just being very good at a few things and especially potentially direct to market online ones um but I, it, it again it's a constant constant contradiction isn't it because we want to go in and be able to choose whatever we want today yeah. but also we want it to be like the best and the freshest and and also we want our girlfriend or wife to be able to choose what they want and our kids to be able to choose and our grandparents so it's probably just not going to exist but some of the places who are very specialist in what they do i think have been incredibly successful mm. yeah I, have, um, I, I think curation is just massively important and valuable and actually like more so, more and more so yes. finding a place and a, uh, that you trust that is going to have good stuff each each time you go there. Um, I, I, there's another sketch, which is just uh, an it's idea. Right, you're tonight. showing off yeah. now, mate. No, that's just that. But evidently, I think about these things a lot, um, which is good teacher is like a DJ for learning is is the idea. It's just a, it's just a metaphor. And I just think, you know, like there's, there's a trillion things you could listen to, but if you listen to a DJ, they've they've picked out yes. these, are, these are the tracks that I think you'll like now. And I'm going to introduce some to you. Maybe you're not. Maybe this is new to you. You wouldn't have picked this, but I'm going to introduce yeah. it to you. And the teacher is like that too. You know, there's so much choice for what you can read and learn at any point on the web. Yeah. And actually, it's super valuable to have somebody who's like, I've been through this stuff. I'm going to teach you these these things, and forget about those things. And it's so nice to like not worry about all of that other stuff and just take these. Well, yeah. that, that brings us on, and I'm going to use that little segue to take us into the, the next pillar of too much information, right? Yeah. And I think, I think the obvious place that my brain goes to with this is um, like 24-hour news, and 24-hour yeah. news coming at you from at least three or four different channels, if you want it, as well as on social media, as well as uh, on the radio, as well as... Uh, the newspapers it's it's everywhere if you want to seek it out but that's that's just in news right information obviously then expands much wider than that it's pretty staggering how much how much information and content is is produced at any more point and you know tom you're, you're making products i'm making more more content <laughs> put it on the web here's another thing for you to read actually I, I do think about that quite a lot like if i've got you know loads of stuff in my inbox and i'm an, if you know if i'm not adding value don't subscribe to sketch explanations the point is like is it it's quick and easy maybe it gives you something maybe it doesn't but it hopefully doesn't take loads of time like going through all that information 
although I haven't said that, I, like our kids could have the TV on now with subtitles going and be listening to music at the same time somehow and somehow manage to process these <laughs> process these things. I, I just can't do that. Maybe I just can't do that anymore. I think multitasking does kind of fall into this too much information, right, Pillar? Yeah. I, 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 I'm not very good at it. I have to focus on one thing at a time. But I don't know, is, is multitasking, does that, does that bleed into too much information, like an information overload that your brain is trying to, to I think work in, with at any one time? In many respects, I think um, multitasking is box in the fact that I don't think any of us can truly multitask. We just switch between relatively yeah. quickly. And yeah. so we think we're multitasking, but actually all we're doing is one at a time and switching. And there's a certain amount of, I think it's proven that there's a certain amount of time it takes us to switch. So, you know, if you're trying to do more than two things, you're probably drastically failing at those three things you think you're doing. You're actually burning the, the toast at the same time as not entertaining the child and probably misordering that thing that you're ordering on your phone at the same time. Mm. Um, Mm. So it sounds, it's a, sounds like you're speaking from experience with that. Uh, yeah, it's very specific. Uh, of experience of watching others, obviously. Uh, and <laughs> but definitely too much information or trying, trying to do too many things at the same time. Mm. And this world of ours trying to push things at us the whole time. It's actually it's one of the reasons I love living outside London. I found being in London just too hectic, too much stuff trying to come at me the whole time and trying to absorb it all and i much prefer the kind of i'm in a town in you know, st albans outside to the north and then i work actually in the middle of the countryside like i go out yeah. and there's fields all around me so i really love trying to reduce the amount of information coming at me but then i do also love going into the center of london and seeing you guys and seeing other people and getting that dose of information and too much coming at me well you know it's, it is a choice as to how much information you want to subject yourself to right if, if yeah. you want to avoid the news you can do that quite easily you don't watch the news you don't put the radio on you don't read the news blogs or whatever else you know you can avoid it yeah i have a i have a thing with my my dad where he can't avoid it he's yes. really compelled to watch all the news and from as as in as in a kind of that it's his kind of like a social responsibility to know what's going on potentially i don't know I, if it's, I, I understand that yeah yeah, I yeah understand that. yeah and so and so you know his thing is well you can't just like not not know what's going on just sit in your own world ignoring you know real life out there but, but then there's you? also like a little, I, I sort of feel like if you know most important things happen i'll probably find out about it it's not like i have zero news mm. i just don't watch it every so day. john i'd be very interested in your strategy to this like do you look at the news once a week once a day like at all do you like you just hear it in conversation yeah yeah little things i found that's a good like, question this tommy because yeah because yeah, i'm really just, intrigued because i think john has probably John's got character. this right yeah, yeah. because <laughs> personally know. i feel like rob and i are probably on the if we haven't checked the news every hour we're probably about to yeah at least every day which Every t- day, twice a, day and a few yeah. times. And I personally have to limit myself. Like, I give it up for long stretches because you, I am you quite that, addicted yeah. to it. And and I don't find it that positive. I don't really know why I do it. A social responsibility, I slightly claim. But I'd be interested in Jono's approach. Mm. Go on, Jono. Pressure's yeah. on you. Well, He's I, just reading the news. No, I was, just, <laughs> I was just looking for a sketch. <laughs> oh, here we go. I was looking for a sketch because there's one about... Um, essentially about watching too much news and that it makes you unhappy um yeah. i will i will find that in a, in a bit i found that little little strategies I've, i found useful for example if i pick up a paper on the way in to work don't take it on the train so i limit my time and i put it back on the stack and then i get on the train and that means i make the most of my train journey by reading my book and I don't find myself paging through random pages of the paper just because I have it, you know, stuff like that, like limiting your potential exposure to it. I also just, yeah, I don't know. Don't put the TV yeah, on. Yeah, this ability. And... Like, you don't really eat chocolate either, do you? It just doesn't really do it for you. God, it's perfect. It's so it? good. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, w- I was going to share uh, one of 
had so many so many related sketches i never realized this but um one of my favorite sketches which is on the wall here is a zen proverb which is when drinking tea yes just drink tea um and it like the idea is is just focus on what you're doing at the time in that yeah. moment and not try and be doing two three things at the time yeah and not try and be absorbing this and uh absorbing that all the time so you know if if you're listening and you're walking feel free to stop listening and just enjoy your walk yeah, yeah. but then or turn this stop... off and just walk yeah but uh, then when you've stopped <laughs> your walk and you finish your walk turn it back on and turn, <laughs> turn, it, turn it back on so thank you too yeah. much information yeah exactly <laughs> um, well, we, you know we took we talked about information a lot about within the context of news but there, you know there's other sources of information you know the internet is this incredible tool incredibly powerful tool and there's so much information on there um but one area where perhaps too much information isn't necessarily a great thing is um in the world of like medical concerns you know if you've if you've got a medical issue or something you're concerned about and you go on and google it is that always a great thing all the information that you could be subjecting yourself to how accurate is it how how relevant is it to you do you fully understand what's being said yeah no nah, it's dangerous i think also in america i think there's a little bit of an aspect of the doctors are almost looking for stuff partially a bit as well like uh, the friends i know who live in america they they just the doctors are always always finding things that are wrong with them that need some form of medication I'm like, is that necessary? <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> because for a lot of people, it's a, it's a commercial yeah. entity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if yeah, if you're aware of enough of these things, it's easier to sort of think that maybe you have, maybe you have some. <laughs> yeah. I, I, it's a bit like watching TV. I found I found that sketch, by the way, which is called Mean World Syndrome, which is uh, all about essentially they did a study of like t t people who watched a lot of TV and people who didn't. And they found that those who watch more believe the world is a meaner place. Yeah. Essentially. And that's yeah. Why, and so there's a few things where people believe the world's more dangerous. They yeah. believe more people are young. They believe that people are not to be trusted. And there were also some other attitudes like believing women's places at home coming from watching t too much TV. But anyway, wow. so the name for it was like mean world, mean world syndrome from watching, watching too much. Yeah. Do you know when the research was done? Because it feels like I'm hoping things have improved a bit. It, it could, yeah, it could well be. I, I think this. I think, yeah, it's probably at least, at least ten years ago. Probably well more. I don't, I'm not sure. Yeah, let's hope. All right. Well, let's move on to the last one. Too fast. Too much speed. If you want to put it like that. This. And so we do live in a in a culture of immediacy now. All right. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, where if you go onto Amazon, you can have it delivered same day sometimes right and there are all these um within the hour shopping deliveries that you can have um even with communications on emails and sms and whatsapp whatever you know there's an expectation that if you send something someone's going to respond straight away there's this fast fast everything now 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 kind of culture that we all live in and again i appreciate from what we we're talking about at the, at the top of the podcast that might not apply to uh, other people in from other cultures or in yeah. in a different demographic other parts of the world perhaps maybe it's maybe it's different but there's definitely a culture of immediacy in our worlds i feel and definitely probably, again for a lot of our listeners uh, i was talking to my dad the other day and he lamented the days where things ha were used to have to be done by letter yeah can you imagine because mm, you you could write a business letter send it off you know the guy the, the person wouldn't get it for at least a day if yeah. not possibly two yeah. or three. He said, that actually, in some respects, it was quite a good thing because people would kind of think things through, maybe calm down. Yeah. <laughs> and it just meant that you were, under, you were less under this constant pressure. I, I never lived in that world. We were always emailed in the working world that I've known. I, I was thinking about the, um, you, you, if you read like biographies of like scientists, it's often they have, they're made from like going through their letters and, and they wrote these really long thoughtful detailed mm -hmm. letters back and forth yeah and it's such an interesting thing like i've never i think like sat down and spent hours or days over a letter and then sent it so maybe i did when i was you know 14 or something once um but but yeah you, i don't know you, you'd never do that now or something you just 
and then you write a blog post or you just send it in <laughs> you send in a thousand messages in whatsapp or something i don't know it's just yeah. a different different way of doing stuff but maybe it was better because you, as you say you spend a lot more time thinking about what you're going to send before you do it i don't know and one of the things that really kind of drives me to try and do things quickly and again we're talking about the oh was it the filling the space what was that the um law of expansion thank you yeah you know again this kind of falls back again this kind of comes back to the law of expansion right that if you, you fit your activity the time that you've got to do it um and i'm definitely guilty of kind of over cramming my to-do lists in a day and then setting an expectation for what i want to achieve in the day and then not actually doing it because that that list was completely unrealistic in the first place because i'm trying to do everything as fast as i possibly can and move on to the next uh, as opposed to i don't know i don't know giving myself two things to do within the day which is probably realistic and then feeling good about myself at the end of it yeah it was, it was quite nice when we went um uh, on holiday to denmark this year and you might know that denmark has has this concept of higger which I'm the, probably, the home of higger yeah exactly pronouncing wrong, which is about you know spending time getting cozy with your family not doing very much just a bit of quality time and actually during the summer there was some really windy days um where you couldn't really do very much you couldn't go as in, you couldn't you couldn't go swim or bike and things like that and so we spent quite a lot of time just inside just us not doing a lot just looking out the window playing a few games we played like matching pairs over and over again it was really mm. quite fun actually and I, sometimes it's a sort of blessing where you're like you were forced to stop so i have that same feeling when i get on a flight when the flight is like eight hours or something and sometimes i wish it was 11 because i'm like oh i have three hours where i could just stop and i don't have to do anything now yeah and so it was yeah it was quite a nice nice blessing to like actually we don't have to do anything today there's nothing to do. we can't go and do the things which we were going to do so we'll just stay in and enjoy it. it's really nice but where does the pressure come from to constantly be on the go to be having a full agenda and be doing everything as fast as you can and moving on to the next where where where's that come from partially ourselves partially our society our friends our culture do you think do you think we do that more than our parents possibly did yeah for sure my parents often talk to me about how do you do why are you trying to do all this stuff like (laughs) what are you doing (laughs) (laughs) And when, and when the kids go to stay with my grandparents, they'll they'll, they'll have the most amazing time. Uh, just with like, your parents, their grandparents, yeah, because yeah. they'll go and like just pick blackberries. That will be like the afternoon's activities, or dig up some potatoes, or you know, like, and they just spend ages doing it and have fun and play together. And you know, whereas we would have set loads of things to do, and it, it's helping me to understand more and more as well. But I, I think there is this strive to do more. Mm. Yeah. Well, I mean, one of the beauties of Sketch Explanations, the podcast, is that you can take your time to listen to it. You, you don't have to fill your brain with, with lots of stuff. With You can take in the information if you want to. Um, there's a choice of... There's uh, Actually, no, this doesn't work. Yeah, move on. Move on. <laughs> well, no, it's funny, because uh, I, I was, I was going to say, actually, that... Um, it's quite common now to watch videos or listen to things faster than real time, right? Yeah, so listen quite to often, one and a half the yeah, speed. Listen to an audio book at 1.2, 1.5 speed because it's too slow at normal talking to me. I was, I was thinking that there's probably people listening to this at 1.5 speed. You're right. <laughs> yeah. Do you know when I, when I edit it, when I edit it, yeah. I'll go through it like 1.8 the speed sometimes. That's quite challenging. Yeah, I quite enjoy the challenge. Quick. Quite enjoy the challenge. I always um, listen back at one point five. Do you? Sorry, yeah, I'm one of those people. Apologise. Apologise. You're trying to do well, things as quick as you can. Move on. I do. You know, back to the the, the kids thing. I, I was kids got quite into watching videos of like Minecraft and stuff on YouTube, and they will. All the videos are just manic. I, I sometimes I just wanted to stop and turn them off because everything is edited perfectly together. So there's no yes. there's no breaks. There's no ums and ahs. There's no there's, yeah. There's no there's no there's no ums and ahs. There's not a single 
pause in the conversation and everything is like non-stop and the, and the footage is changing you know from something which you know it would take you a minute to walk from here to there it's like boom flash here boom flash here oh and yeah. this happened oh and look what's happened there and, boom. and it just doesn't stop for minutes and i do i don't know i i find it a bit stressful they they seem fine but i don't know maybe maybe well, it's they, not Who knows? so this this is really interesting and i think the four pillars i, I think I, and we talked about this right at the top right that they're probably uh, manifest themselves the four pillars of too much I think probably man themselves I think the four pillars of too much probably manifest themselves differently for kids as they do to adults and they probably always will as generations and the cultures around different generations change yeah and the probably the pillars go up at different speed because when you're young you maybe don't actually have that much stuff and certainly in our 20s we had hardly anything as it as it were but when you get into your 60s you end up having a lot of stuff and don't have the energy to to do the clearing out the throwing away but um, maybe you slow things down a bit then yeah you change in different ways you're probably your information and your speed of doing stuff mm. um uh, and i think we're very um uh, rude about uh, uh, older generations as to how slow they drive or walk down the high street. Or I think we've all probably all found ourselves doing that of like, you know, yeah, get on but, with it. But based on what we've been talking about now, <laughs> doesn't that seem really nice? Yeah. 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 And, and often they're probably not rushing back and forth because they've forgotten yeah. something over there. They yeah. just moving. It's, just, it's all of us trying not to be late. It's a problem. Yeah. Yeah. Because I try to do too much. <laughs> I mean, if, so, yeah. so I think one of my, my closing questions around this, if you were suddenly forced for whatever reason to have less stuff, to have fewer choices, to have access to less information and to slow things down, do you think your life would be any worse? Do you think you'd miss anything in particular? I don't think it would be worse. Honestly, I think There's the answer depends. I think it's like I had a wonderful holiday on this Scottish island with no information, no WhatsApps, no any of that, and, uh, but uh, and no Amazon. But if there'd been the school play tomorrow and Jack needed a dagger because we hadn't got it for the whatever he was going to be in the play, you know, then that would have been very you, difficult. You'd have whittled them. Well, I, we would have whittled, actually very good example John. we would have been able to whittle it um but i think it comes and goes and at certain times you do want lots of information like when you're writing a thesis you want loads and loads of information we're so glad that we've got it all there so we can then distill it and um so i think it the easy answer is to say yes i think the complex answer is to say that yes but we would never do it and we would constantly have this up and down of too much trying to reduce too much trying to reduce so my my a suggestion for a happier less stressful lifestyle be to maybe try and carve out a bit of time at yes. regular intervals however that is to try and reduce the height of these four pillars by some yeah. means for yes. a day for half a day at the weekend i don't know whatever it might be uh, yeah create little rules for yourself like john said with his not taking the paper on the train just leaving it at the station for me um i don't take my mobile phone upstairs anymore it's not allowed so i leave the phone downstairs when i go to bed and it stays down there and that that i found that really helps because otherwise i'm in bed reading the news mm -hmm. going well, what am i doing i should be going to sleep yeah yeah I can't, I can't remember where i read it but um some somebody said why don't you just spend 10 minutes doing nothing and then why don't you spend 15? When when was the last time you spent half an hour doing just nothing? Not like watching something or reading mm. something, just doing mm. nothing. I was like, I, gosh, I can't even remember. Mm. Spend half, when did I spend half an hour doing nothing? And how would you feel about doing that if you did? Would you feel guilty? <laughs> yeah it's probably like meditation isn't it at the beginning you're like your brain's doing all this stuff and by the end you're probably like oh only half an hour was it really time to stop already <laughs> yeah i don't know there we go well, in the um in the float tank that was that was probably when oh good yeah, yeah. the isolation float tank yeah, yeah and i was in there for three days and didn't notice <laughs> <laughs> Um, any other business on the four pillars of too much? Anything else? 
No, I really look forward to hearing feedback from others about mm. their views on it, what they've done, what strategies they've Any got. Any strategies? Any I tips? really look forward to strategies and tips. I love that. Well, maybe, maybe I'll say one That's strategy. My go to bed strategy. Okay, yeah. Well, well, just quickly, one one strategy which I think was a key point of the book, and it was about children, but I think it works for us as well. Actually, two things. One was control your environment. So, you, like clearing yes. your desk to focus and the other one was about rhythms and routine and actually how that that benefits you is that like i i, I don't have to wonder what happens now because it's seven o'clock i know that i go upstairs and i have a shower and i brush my teeth and i go to bed as a child for example that is the routine and that and i get up and i do this and i go here and i come back and i don't have to it takes away all those choices and that can be really beneficial and perhaps we you know, do with a bit more rhythm and routine sometimes mm. in our lives sounds good to me sounds good to me all right well listen driven by the desire to avoid you our listeners feeling like you've had too much from the three pillars of sketch Nations, the podcast i'm going to round off this week's chat there i said pillars not pillocks <laughs> <laughs> we'll be back in a tick to go through the post bag of your correspondence but for now hickory dickory doc the mouse ran up the clock the clock struck one, the mouse ran down, and that's where this podcast must stop. Thanks for listening. Go well, everybody. Stay well. Goodbye. Goodbye. Bye. All music on this podcast series is sourced from the very talented Frank Cinelli. And you can find loads more tracks at frankcinelli.com.